In Module 7, we'll be discussing HIV testing and reporting, the role of the Rhode Island Department of Health. During this module, you'll learn about the CDC and the Department of Health's authority to collect information on HIV. There'll be an overview of reportable conditions and a general overview of, of HIV in Rhode Island. We will also go over surveillance and prevention activities that take place at the Department of Health and conclude with some information about privacy and confidentiality considerations. By the end of this session, viewers should be able to describe when HIV is reportable to the Department of Health, why it is important to report, how to report, and what other activities the Department of Health completes to support HIV prevention. Both the CDC and the Department of Health have the power to define what conditions are reportable to protect the public's health. Both HIV and STDs, which include syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, as well as hepatitis C, are required to be reported to the Department of Health, and this is based on both CDC and Department of Health mandates. The local power granted to the Department of Health is granted through the Director of Health under statutory authority from General Law 26-6.3. The link is provided here for your viewing pleasure. Laws are clarified further to inform the public and providers through additional documents. These documents may be rules and regulations, policies, manuals, or guidelines. One link is provided below, which goes to the rules and regulations pertaining to the reporting of infectious diseases. Why are infectious diseases reportable? Infectious diseases are reportable to inform or notify public health officials of threats to the health of the population. This is to help prevent the spread of disease, to detect outbreaks occurring in the community, and to determine the cause of such outbreaks. It also helps public health officials monitor and predict disease volume and trends over time. All of this information is also helpful to inform educational campaigns and inform prevention opportunities that will assure the health of the public. The Rhode Island General Law not only specifies that HIV is reportable, but also goes into greater detail to discuss when HIV testing is required, when HIV testing should be offered to individuals, and when informed consent is either required for testing or can be waived. The general laws also talk about the types of facilities that can perform testing. Some specific guidance includes what to do in the case of an occupational exposure, how to test incarcerated populations, when to test during pregnancy, and rules around testing youth. And we encourage you to take a look at the Rhode Island general laws or the rules and regulations that were provided at the links previously. Who can test for HIV? In general, HIV testing is permissible in three settings. Sites that are performing rapid HIV testing and have been CLIA waived. And this typically includes Rhode Island Department of Health funded agencies and other community-based agencies, perhaps some of the agencies that you all will be working with. HIV testing can also be performed at Rhode Island hospital laboratories. This typically includes lifespan laboratories, the Care New England system, charter care, and other large hospital systems. Finally, HIV testing is completed or conducted at the state health laboratory. It's important to note that in Rhode Island, no commercial or non-hospital-based laboratories are allowed to conduct HIV diagnostic testing. That means institutions such as Quest, Mayo, or even our local Eastside Clinical laboratories are not allowed to conduct HIV diagnostic testing. All confirmatory testing is required to be performed by the state health laboratory. This also means that while hospital laboratories can conduct HIV diagnostic testing, if they identify a positive result, they have to send specimens to the state lab to be further tested. As far as we know, there are no other jurisdictions in the U.S. that have this type of rule or law in place. CDC supports two primary models for HIV testing, routine testing in clinical settings. 
This is the typical blood draw that you may receive at a healthcare provider, either a primary care, an urgent care, or an emergency department or hospital inpatient visit. The CDC also supports targeted testing in non-clinical settings. This is where rapid testing comes into play. HIV testing is a critical element of something called the HIV care continuum. The HIV care continuum is a map or a graph that depicts individuals along a spectrum from at risk of HIV to being diagnosed with HIV, being engaged in care with an HIV medical provider, being on medication, and finally being virally suppressed. CDC recommends that all adolescents and adults get tested for HIV at least once in their life and more frequently if they are a high-risk population, such as men who have sex with men or people who inject drugs. HIV rapid testing is an important strategy to identify and target those individuals and ensure that if they are at risk or if they are infected, that they know their status so they can hit the other elements of the care continuum, such as being in care, being on medication, and achieving viral suppression. Two links are provided here to show the two applicable rules and regulations. One rule and regulation document pertains specifically to HIV and goes over many of the elements that we just discussed. The second is the general rule and regulation that talks about the reporting of infectious diseases, which includes HIV, STDs, and hepatitis. There are many reportable conditions, and they are reportable either to the Department of Health or the Department of Health and CDC together. Red and blue coded conditions shown here are high priority conditions. They must be reported to the Health Department immediately upon identification or suspicion. These are highly transmissible and very severe diseases that need to be worked on immediately. Black coded conditions must be reported to the Department of Health within four days of recognition. This list includes hepatitis, HIV, and the STDs. A common question is if reporting to the Health Department violates HIPAA. The HIPAA privacy rule expressly permits disclosure without an individual authorization to public health authorities. This reporting is authorized so that the public health authorities can help prevent and control disease and can conduct surveillance, investigations, and interventions if necessary. In this case, the Rhode Island Department of Health meets the, this authorization and is exempt from HIPAA privacy regulations. Who typically reports infectious diseases to the Department of Health? Laboratories, healthcare providers, qualified professional test counselors, institutions, and other individuals who suspect outbreaks may report. Laboratories typically report immediately and automatically through their information management system anytime a positive result occurs. Healthcare providers typically report on something called a case report form that is requested from the Department of Health and includes additional demographic characteristics and risk information, as well as phone number and address information. Qualified professional test counselors may report to the Health Department if they identify a positive rapid result for HIV, hepatitis, or even syphilis. There are two ways of reporting, and it depends on if the individual works for a funded agency or a non-funded agency, and we'll talk about those a little bit more later. Institutions and other individuals may report during a cluster or outbreak investigation. Typically, we see this happen with something like influenza or norovirus in a nursing home or a school. Institutions or school nurse teachers or superintendents may report concerns about a high number of illnesses or absences that will generate some type of a public health response. So what exactly needs to be reported for HIV? Any positive HIV result is technically reportable. <clears throat> and this includes both screening tests 
as well as confirmatory tests. Screening tests are typically considered to be a laboratory uh, antigen-antibody combination test or a rapid test that you all are being trained to perform. A confirmatory test is typically a viral RNA or antigen test, something that detects the actual HIV virus. There are also second or third tier antibody tests, which are different from the initial screening tests that are also used to confirm HIV. All elements of HIV testing are reportable to the health department. As you may recall from an earlier slide, the state health laboratory is the only, is the only laboratory that can conduct confirmatory testing. Thus, the majority of reporting to the health department comes from the state lab, which includes a screening test, the antigen test, and a subsequent antibody test. Once an individual is diagnosed with HIV, standard care includes routine testing of CD4 and viral loads. CD4 testing tests the person's immune system's ability to respond. Viral load testing looks for circulating virus in the person's body. Each of these tests are reportable to the health department. These tests are not considered diagnostic tests, and so they are often performed by commercial laboratories or hospital laboratories. The major reporters are Lifespan, Mayo Medical Laboratories, and LabCorp. Any provider who provides care for an HIV-infected individual who identifies an opportunistic infection, that is, a secondary infection related to a diagnosis of AIDS, should report to the health department. The health department is interested in understanding individuals who progress to late stage disease or AIDS and how to support them back into care so that they get healthy and they reduce their ability to transmit to others. Finally, any physician who suspects HIV or diagnoses HIV, even without laboratory evidence, can report to the health department. Typically, this is seen in the case of international migration, in which individuals migrate to Rhode Island already diagnosed with HIV and on medication. Before the individual is tested, if the physician acknowledges this HIV diagnosis, they can report to the health department. And infants who are exposed to HIV through pregnancy and delivery are reportable to the health department. This is to ensure that infants are followed appropriately by healthcare providers and the mom is followed appropriately by healthcare providers to reduce the chance of mother to child transmission. In this case, the infants are not cases of HIV, but they are reportable to the health department. How does reporting occur? I talked about this a little bit already. From laboratories, we receive all positive results, and that usually is through an electronic report or by mail. From providers, we receive case report form information. This is done on a specific form for HIV, as well as specific forms for STDs and hepatitis. These typically come via mail or from a phone call in which a Department of Health staff member takes the information over the phone. From rapid testers, as I said earlier, there are multiple ways to report. The Department of Health funds agencies to provide rapid testing in the community. For those agencies that are funded, there should be at least one person on the staff that is trained in something called Evaluation Web. Evaluation Web is a CDC-sponsored program that you can access on your computer to report rapid testing. And this includes negative results as well as positive. Non-funded rapid test agencies or individuals should report via phone. The phone number is provided here. The reason why we ask for non-funded testers to also report to, to the Department of Health via phone is because any rapid test is considered a preliminary test and the person needs to be referred for confirmatory testing. The Department of Health wants to know about preliminary positive results so we can ensure that a confirmatory test is conducted and we can work with the rapid tester to make sure that takes place. Let's pause here and remember where rapid testing fits within 
healthcare, and public health infrastructure. Rapid testing can actually take place in a number of diff different settings, including clinical settings. Some laboratories choose to use rapid tests as their first test before they order a blood draw. So primary cares, hospitals, urgent cares, emergency department may use rapid test technology. Most often in Rhode Island, we see rapid testing being performed from community-based sites. These are both mobile sites, either street outreach or in a van, fixed sites around the state, and also the Department of Health staff perform their own testing. A rapid test is considered to be a preliminary test. If the person is negative, however, it is a conclusive negative result. If the individual is positive, the most important thing to note here is that the individual needs to be linked to confirmatory testing. Testers are encouraged to provide an active referral and hand off the individual to a new agency or hospital setting to get tested. Some tips for testers include discussing what the client can expect for a negative result or a positive result before the testing is complete. Prepare a release of information. If the individual is being tested anonymously or in a confidential manner, but the person is positive on their, ra on their rapid test, you may want to notify them that you'll get additional information from them to help guide them through the system, such as a first name or a complete name and a phone number. Once the individual is rapid test positive, the linkage to confirmatory testing is typically to someplace like an STD clinic, a hospital, an infectious disease specialist, or if you're testing within a medical setting, you may refer them to an, another staff member for a blood draw and additional testing. That confirmatory test will be run either by the state lab or a hospital laboratory. If it's positive, those results will be reported to the Department of Health and additional information will be received on this individual, such as the case report form from the provider. The reason why we want rapid testers to report to us, either through evaluation web or through the phone, is also so that we can understand how individuals are first being diagnosed or first being tested for HIV. We want to be able to characterize if they were first identified by a community site, a rapid test agency, and then linked to confirmatory services. It's helpful for our understanding of public health and prevention in Rhode Island. At this time, we're gonna move away from rules and regulations related to HIV and infectious disease reporting and take a brief overview of HIV in Rhode Island and why rapid testing is so important. We know that one in eight people nationally who have HIV are unaware of their status. We also know, based on the disease progression for HIV, that many people are unaware of their status because they have no symptoms. We also have a great tool in that HIV rapid test technology can provide results in under 20 minutes. Many people who are HIV infected are not in regular health care or are not out to their providers, meaning that they may be men who have sex with men or bisexual and may not be sharing their sexual behavior with their providers. Rhode Island data shows that about a third of all newly identified cases of HIV are diagnosed late in their course of disease when they also have an AIDS diagnosis. All of this taken together suggests that there are opportunities for individuals to be tested outside of the normal healthcare system. People may not be going to their doctors or may not be honest about their risk behavior with their providers. And many people are being diagnosed late, which supports that testing just isn't happening as often as it should. Rapid test technology offers us an opportunity to bring the test to people and help them identify their status earlier than they may have otherwise. We know that early diagnosis is important. It helps improve personal health outcomes. It then reduces disease transmission to others. And long-term, from a societal perspective, it does reduce healthcare costs. 
The Rhode Island Department of Health and the state of Rhode Island in general have signed on to something called the 90-90-90 initiative. The 90-90-90 initiative is sponsored by the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, and the link is provided here. The goals of 90-90-90 are by 2020 to have 90% of Rhode Islanders infected with HIV to know their status, to have 90% engaged in care, and that means have attended at least one medical appointment in the last 12 months. And finally, for 90% of people to have achieved viral suppression or have a viral load on record of less than 200. The picture here shows Governor Raimondo, Mayor Alorza, and Director Alexander Scott signing the declaration of the 9090 initiative. And this made Rhode Island and the City of Providence the first city-state combination to sign on to this international campaign. Rapid testing is an integral part of these goals. Individuals need to know that they are infected with HIV before they can progress through the care continuum shown here and ensure they're engaged in care, on medication, and achieving viral suppression. Rapid testing allows us to find people who don't know their status and help them along this path. The Office of HIV and AIDS at the Health Department is broken into two general areas. We've described a lot of HIV surveillance. The HIV surveillance program oversees the reporting of results and the reporting of case report forms to identify and describe HIV in Rhode Island, which includes new diagnoses, all persons living with HIV, and those who have been exposed. These data are de-identified and then reported to the CDC to help inform the national picture. The HIV surveillance program then produces data analyses to describe what's going on in Rhode Island and support care and prevention activities. And information gathering. The HIV prevention program has a wide impact in the community. It is our outward facing work and can be summed up into a few key activities such as rapid testing in the community, condom distribution, partner services, a syringe exchange program, return to care program, and some general social marketing and education campaigns. We will talk about some of these activities now. The Department of Health funds a rapid test program in the community. Currently, three agencies are funded, AIDS Care Ocean State, AIDS Project Rhode Island, and Project Weber slash Project Renew. These agencies operate in over 30 venues, including their agency offices or headquarters, as well as local bathhouses, college campuses, drop-in centers that provide supportive services to sex workers, mobile sites and street outreach, with, which may be on the street walking around with backpacks or in a van going to uh, high traffic areas, needle exchange programs, and other community events, as well as in homeless shelters and bars and clubs. It's also important to remember that the Department of Health does have staff that provide rapid testing and they may be considered as a fourth entity providing services around the state. In 2014 and 2015, there were seven funded sites and over 4,000 tests were performed each year. Now we expect about 2,500 tests to be conducted every year. Many of the individuals who are being served by these agencies are high-risk individuals and identify as gay, bisexual, or other men who have sex with men, individuals who had some high-risk heterosexual contact, or are people who inject drugs. The Condom Distribution Program is a campaign to distribute condoms and advertisements for safer sex practices to local venues and clinics. Our program gives out free condom dispenser wall units, shown in the picture here, and they come in 200 and 800 count units. Our program also has cookie jar-like dispensers, and there are over 30 around the state. 
Taken all together, there are over 100 dispensers statewide. If you're interested in learning more about the condom distribution program, contact the Department of Health at the number provided. And as you see, in any three month period, we average about 100,000 condoms distributed to agencies, clinics, and the public around the state. Partner services has been discussed throughout this presentation. What is partner services? It's a program to prevent the spread of HIV and STDs. The way it works is that any newly diagnosed case of HIV, syphilis, or gonorrhea are interviewed, counseled, and made ensured that they are linked to care for treatment and follow-up. During this interview, staff members from the health department obtain information about sexual and needle sharing partners. These individuals are then contacted to notify them about their risk and ensure that they are linked to testing and treatment. During the informing of partners, Department of Health staff members indicate that they are qualified to conduct HIV rapid testing and may perform the testing themselves. Partner services is voluntary and confidential. The index client or the individual that was newly diagnosed do not have to take part in this activity. However, the health department has been very successful and on average 95% of new diagnoses take up this program. Identifying information is never revealed during interviews. The index client is never exposed to the partner and partner information is protected as securely as case information. Why is partner services important? Partners have a right to know that they've been exposed to HIV or STDs. People who are aware of their status are more likely to change their risk behavior and early detection facilitates access to medical care. For individuals who are interested in becoming healthcare providers, it is important to note that healthcare providers can inform partners of newly diagnosed individuals of their exposure to HIV. This is important because sometimes individuals do not feel comfortable participating in partner services or sharing all of their partner information with the Department of Health. The healthcare provider may have a better relationship with the client or patient and be able to get this information from them and in a tactful way notify the close contact of their exposure. While this is great in theory and it is allowed under Rhode Island general laws, the Department of Health al also understands that providers have to maintain a strong relationship with their patient and sometimes this type of disclosure is hard. We put it here for new professionals to understand the opportunity and encourage the use of this clause in the general laws when possible or when appropriate. The Department of Health also has a return to care program. The return to care program operates by receiving referrals from individuals or providers when they identify patients who are out of care. The Department of Health receives this referral and then investigates the information in the, on the individual to find out if we have a new address or phone number that we can use to contact that person. At that point, the Department of Health will interview the patient, either on the phone or in person, to identify barriers to care and offer services to get over those barriers. The Department of Health staff and patient work together to find a solution and allow the patient to re-engage in care. Sometimes this is as simple as trying to get a taxi set up for the person to an appointment or calling with an appointment reminder. And sometimes it's referral to other social service needs. Rapid test sites are encouraged to report to the return to care program if a client does not receive a confirmatory test. There are circumstances where an individual will get a rapid test 
and get set up with a confirmatory appointment and never go to it. We encourage agencies to use their own resources to find the person and encourage them to get back for a confirmatory test. But at any point, if the agency feels like they don't have any more options at their disposal, they can call the health department and make a referral to the return to care program. Finally, we're going to talk briefly about data security and confidentiality. This is one of the most important areas at the health department because ensuring the security and privacy of these data is our number one priority. All physical and electronic data security adheres to national guidance, which is shared under the National Center for HIV, Hepatitis, STD, and Tuberculosis Prevention at the CDC. These guidelines recommend standards for security, confidentiality, and use of information. And they apply both to the public health program at the health department and our contractors. The policies dig into details around physical security, digital security, rights and access for personnel and the agency, and how to mitigate damage in the case of a breach. This slide and the next slide show the 10 guiding principles for ensuring security and confidentiality. I will let you read through them at your leisure. The key components to keep in mind for any rapid tester or any agency in general is to ensure staff are trained properly. And this typically includes an initial training as well as a booster training once a year. You should also ensure physical security of your building, your suite, your offices. This may be as simple as locking cabinets or locking cabinets, locking office, and acknowledgement of a security guard at the front or rear entrance of any building. You should also consider how secure your correspondences are. How do you use phone, fax, and mail to share information? Do you use the minimum amount of identifying information? Are there areas where you can make improvements? The Department of Health and many of you working with community-based agencies also have to consider fieldwork protocols. How can you go into the field to provide services but ensure the protection of PII? The Department of Health has locking boxes that can be used in the field for securing forms and other materials. We also have policies on what to do in the case of not being able to return to the health department at the end of the day. Key, another key component of these guidelines is electronic data security how to secure data that is transmitted within your agency as well as to the health department or other agencies or healthcare providers for the purposes of information sharing. Information should be encrypted and there are standards in the guidelines per the CDC. In conclusion, HIV is reportable to the Department of Health. Rapid test programs should report to the health department. It, they should also ensure referral to confirmatory testing. Rapid tests can be reported via evaluation web, if you're a funded agency, or via phone. And when in doubt, call 401-222-2577 for guidance. The Department of Health has statutory authority to this information and is HIPAA exempt. The state of Rhode Island and our leadership have ambitious goals of having 90% of individuals diagnosed, 90% engaged in care, and 90% virally suppressed by 2020. HIV rapid testing is an integral part of this strategy. HIV rapid testing can be performed by many agencies and is performed by many agencies around the state. And this includes both funded agencies and non-funded agencies. 
Agencies and testers are encouraged to notify the Department of Health of any hard to reach individuals. This may include individuals who test rapid test positive and are not linked to medical care or a confirmatory test. The Department of Health funds rapid test programs. That program is one tool in an array of services offered by the Health Department, which also includes social marketing campaigns, condom distribution services, partner services, return to care activities, and core surveillance activities. And, as we just went over, agencies and testers should ensure the highest level of security and confidentiality for the maintenance of personal identifying information. And this includes understanding your physical security, your electronic security, and safeguards for working in the field. Finally, if you have any need for additional information or questions on any of these programs, please contact the Health Department at 401 222-2577, or feel free to reach out to key team members listed here. Thank you.